All I'm going to do now is pass you over to uh, our first speaker of the, uh, the morning, uh, the second morning session, which is Kieran Brown. He's going to be talking to us about earthworms. Well, I'm actually going to be talking more about data. <laughs> um, so, in fact, I don't think I have a single slide of an earthworm in here, but uh, people were earlier put them in, so that's fine. Um, so, my name's Kieran, and I'm the recording officer. Uh, for the Earthworm Society of Britain, so it's my job to try and get people to um, collect earthworm records and submit them to us. Um, and I've been asked to speak about data sharing and what we think about it and how we do it, and etc. So the first th question I really wanted to ask is, should we share our data? Um, and who, who should we be considering when we do, if we are going to think about sharing our data? Well, the first thing is, is our recorders. They're the ones that collect the data, they're the ones that submit the data. So I think it's really important what they think. And in general, they seem to want open data. So then there's also um, Theresa May. So Theresa is currently trying to work out what we need for our earthworms from a Brexit deal. And she can't figure that out if we don't know what earthworms we've got. So there's Trees are, that they're actually looking at earthworm records there in that form. <laughs> um, the NBN network, so this really symbolises the, the recording sector, so the local record centres and all the other people that would like to use our data. What do they want? Do they want access to our data? Do they want open data? I think with both the NBN and, and uh, government agencies, it's probably quite clear that they do want our data to be open because they want to get their hands on it. Same goes for the conservation organisations, if they're going to conserve our biodiversity, they need to know what we've got. So again, it's a common theme, they seem to want to get their hands on our data. Also, we've got to think about the, the funders, the people who actually um, give us money. Uh, the Earthworm site was set up as part of OPAL, which was a lottery funded thing, and the norm with these things, again, is the data is open. So I think, I think that's probably a good range of things to ah. Earth and Society of Britain, we need to think about ourselves as well. What, what do we want from our data? And again, we're a membership funded organisation, so we need to think about our members. And I think it's quite good to make a differentiation between our members and our recorders. Obviously there is a lot of overlap, but they are quite often different people and they may have different wants and needs. So before we decide whether we're going to share our data openly, we should also maybe have a think about what, how do we share a record? Because it's not as simple as you get a record and then, it, and then put it somewhere and share. There's a lot of things in between. So really sharing, I mean dissemination, so I mean getting it out there. But to get there, we have to go all the way from collection. So it's collected by recorders. Um, and then the next step is to figure out if it's a record we want or not. So it goes through a verification process. And as mentioned yesterday, our verification protocol is completely public and open, so anybody can see it's on our website. Um, from there, the data is collated, so it's all put into a really high-tech Excel spreadsheet. And from there, um, it's curated. And I think quite often the curation of data is something that that is not considered as much as it should be. A great deal of my time is not necessarily spent checking people's identifications, but actually checking whether there's information in the Commons field that needs to go into the Habitats field, or, and correcting grid references at, in the middle of the sea, because you don't tend to get that many earthworms there. So yeah, it's about how we go through that process. So, in order, to, in, order, in order to look at this, I thought we should look at the, the people involved. So right at the top, it's actually biological recorders, but also research organisations like the Natural History Museum, the Environment Agency and universities that are collecting the records. And then from there, and this is the earthworm perspective, I'm not saying this is the same for everybody, but the verification is almost entirely done by us. And I'll even go out on a limb and say the odd with the organisation that, that verify records on iRecord, maybe don't put it through a strict protocol like we do. The collation, again, is done by the Earthworm Society of Britain, and the curation is done by the Earthworm Society of Britain. And then 
for sharing, it would then be shared with both the National Biodiversity Network and, and local record centres. So that's what we're talking about, uh, about when we, we talk about sharing a record. I also wanted to point out, though, that there is a lot of potential for local environment record centres to, to provide more impact input with us at all stages if they've got the funding and the resource as well. And I know that they certainly do do that with other groups, so I just wanted to give that a mention. So, right, now we know how we share a record, what would we need to do to instigate this report recording? And, and just as an example, so that people, because there's obviously the, does the data, the collector own that record, or, or how much ownership is transferred to the organisations that are looking after it. So this is the events, and I'm a volunteer, Earthworm Society doesn't have enough money for salaries yet. Um, this is just a list of the events that I uh, run this year. So this is just one person. All of, all of this effort has to go into training people up to get them to record. So there's a lot, there's a lot of work going on in on there, a lot of the time by volunteers. And this all costs money. Um, it costs money and it costs effort. So I'm lucky, I, I do all this for an organisation that has probably the smallest overheads of any society or charity in the world. It, it, we, we really do run on an absolute shoestring budget and our, our overheads are under £200 a year. So we're able to not worry about having to bring in a lot of money. And we've been quite fortunate to work a lot with the Field Studies Council um, for them to help us run the events that we run as well. Um, but a more resilient, it, it does mean that this is reflected in our capacity and that our re recording scheme is really reliant on just the efforts of a, a very few number of volunteers, which you can see in the regularly produced ESB recorder league table. And there's still time to get records in for this year if you want to get involved in, in that highly regarded um, <laughs> table. But a more resilient scheme with a great capacity would require much more in terms of and t resources. And again, I just want to make that point that when I'm talking about what we do, we need to consider with other organisations that they're not running everything for £200. So to go back to should we share our data for all of these organisations, I thought it would be interesting to have a look at, they all want to use our data. Who are the people that actually put put money into it and, and help us to collect that data. So I'll tell you who doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Theresa May knows she needs our records to get this good Brexit deal, yet she doesn't put a penny towards it. Um, I don't know where it's going, it's obviously not going on the NHS. So uh, yeah, the government the government, although we want them to use our data, they don't really have too much of a say in what we do because they don't, they don't fund a lot of what we do. I know they, they, there's funding that goes into other things that we utilise, but they're not a direct funder of, or supporter of the Earth Fund Society of Britain. And I can confirm that Theresa May is not a member either. <laughs> the, um, private funders like, like the Lottery, like Esme Fairburn, and people like that, that fund these recording schemes, they have a massive say in, in what we'll do. Because if they're funding a project and they say, all of our records need to be uh, openly available. I mean, that's the decision made. So um, these, these type of organisations really do have a big influence on whether our data should be open or not. Um, the conservation organisations are stretched as it is. They don't, they don't put a lot of money or effort into, into generating earthworm records specifically. Um, but we understand why. Um, our members pay for it, and again, the MBN face a lot of the recording sector faces um, financial difficulties, and we understand that that's why, for example, with the record centres, we don't get as much um, support and input from them as, as we'd love to have, because they're out trying to fight for their own existence. And then there's obviously our recorders as well. They don't put in money per se, but they put in all the effort and, and that has tremendous value for us. So, 
if we go back to share or not to share, we decided that actually maybe since everybody wants us to share it and since we can afford to share it without undermining um, our <laughs> business model, if I can call it that, uh, we decided that we want to share it. But then what does sharing mean and, and how can this be done? Well, we think it's really important that things are shared on a local level. So we've made a commitment that every year all of the record centres will get our records, regardless of whether they can get it from the gateway or not. So it's very simple, actually. They, I, I send an email to Tom at Alec, and he just forwards that on with the entire database to everybody. And I've spoke to a lot of other recording scheme organisers that say they don't have the time to deal with individual record centres. I don't either. So they just all get my entire database, and they can pick out what they need. We share glo uh, nationally through the NBN Atlas as well. Proud to say that all of our data is currently on there and it's all available at full resolution and it's all available either under a, a CC, uh, a Creative Commons by attribution license or one data set for the Environment Agency is on a, a, under an open government license and we put that on for them because they hadn't. And they gave it to me and said I could do what I want with it, so it's written the Atlas. Uh, we also share all of our stuff globally, because um, like Theresa May, Donald Trump probably wants to make a lot of his decisions based on our data. So we do that automatically through the MBM by allowing all of our data to go to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. We also are open not just about our data, but because we talk a lot about open data, but I think, I think that's, there's other things that we need to be open about as well, and that's our policies. So we make sure that we're very clear that, about how we share our data to our members. And I just really wanted to end on a data flow pathway, because they're the, the flavour of the day. And I've seen a lot of quite complicated ones, but this is ours. It doesn't need to be that complicated. And I'm getting ushered off, so I think, I think it's time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.